You can be seated. Good morning, church. It's great to have you all here on this Sunday morning. And as we gather to worship, we certainly do so with a tremendous amount of hope as we recognize that God is victorious over sin and death. Just this week, I was down at the building uh, from 11 to 5 p.m. waiting on an inspector that did not show up. But no, you don't need to feel bad for me. Uh, I was outside working and trying to, to, to mow the grass and whatever else you do when you're trying to kill uh, hours. And a lady walked by and she said, hey, what's going, what's going on here? And I said, we're going to have a church that's going to be gathering down here, uh, hopefully the beginning of 2020, end of 2019. Uh, and she said, well, what's your church about? I thought, that's a great question. <laughs> we just did a study talking about Own the Vision uh, every week when we get together, I say we were, we're, we're a church that's rooted in the gospel and oriented around the Great Commission. And, and I knew if I said that, she'd be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I said, so we're, we're a group of people that love God, that study his word, that are building community and are about making known the hope of Jesus. And that's, that's why we gather. I, Tiff, I told Tiffany when I got home, I, I told her the story. And she said, that's a great question for everyone in our church to be able to answer. And here's the truth. God in his grace is moving in our midst, and a part of that is just making known his glory. Uh, it's a, just a simple testimony opportunity. Any chance we get to just testify that there is hope, and that hope is found in Jesus. And this morning, as we gather, we're reminded of that hope, and we're reminded that there is a difference between gospel conversations, gospel presentations, but we want to be a church that's committed to both. And over the course of this fall, we're going to begin to introduce some new rhythms within our church life so that we can just be reminded that mission is king in our lives, that we want to be about the mission of our king, and we're going to continue to spotlight gospel conversations. We're going to have opportunities over the course of this fall, moving into next year, for people who worship with us from different nations to pray for the gospel movement within their nations, that we would be a church about the work of God around the world. And I am excited uh, to be a part of that work, and I'm excited to get a link arms with you guys. And just want to remind you that a couple weeks ago, we we gathered celebrating two year, our two-year anniversary. And as we did, we, we were just reminded of God's work that he wants to do among us. And it's certainly a privilege uh, to be able to be a part of that work. And we've been able to send uh, $10,000 to support a church plant uh, back east in Pittsburgh. Uh, this week, I'm going to be gathering with some church planters uh, that are scattered around North America. And as I gather with them, I'm going to be reminded, I guarantee you, that our God is alive, that he's moving, that he's seeking and saving those who are lost, much like he did you, and that the gospel still changes lives. Do we believe that this morning? And we get to sing about that, we get to study about that, and so this morning as we gather, we do so in light of a risen, victorious Savior, and there's no shadow that I would rather be in than the one of Jesus. So this morning, please stand, welcome two people, tell them that you're glad that they're here, and the worship team's going to draw us back to worship.
to worship you this morning, Jesus. Thank you for the cross that you went and died when you didn't have to, Jesus, that you chose to surrender your life, God, so that we would have our lives in you. Jesus, help us to 
uh, open up your word this morning and have our hearts pierced by it, God. Uh, speak through will, speak with your spirit through him to speak to our hearts, to our minds. Let us be focused on what you have to say to us this morning, Jesus. Jesus, we love you, we praise your name, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, we're going to pick up where we left things off last week, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Last week, we began a new series working through the book of Ecclesiastes where King Solomon, at the end of his life, after experiencing all that life would author, would, would offer, he would author this book, a memoir of sorts, where he would expose the vanities that you and I are prone to pursue. He would get to the end of his life and he would write this book of Ecclesiastes and he would begin it saying, vanities of vanities, all is vanity. And last week we unpacked that word, vanity of vanities, that even among the things that are vain, these are vanities of those vanities. They're, they're the, the most meaningless of meaningless pursuits. And as I've reflected on Ecclesiastes in the past and been reminded of those reflections over the course of the last few weeks as we gear up for the study, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by the, the brilliance of this book as God's spirit carried along Solomon to, to expose not just the vanities in life, but in doing so, expose the meaning of life. Every one of us, every one we know and every one of us here, all are in search of the meaning of life. What gives us purpose? What gives our life value and significance? And God would use Solomon, a man who had experienced all that you and I are prone to pursue. He was wise, he was wealthy, he had influence. In fact, when he came in to become king, God had asked him uh, what he desired, that he was going to give him anything because God honored King David so much, a man after God's own heart. And Solomon would ask for wisdom and God would grant him wisdom and, and so much more to the point that his reputation would spread far beyond Jerusalem and Israel, so far south that Queen Sheba from the south would hear of Solomon's splendor and she would travel to Jerusalem to see if, if all of his glory lived up to the hype. Now, you and I know that very few people who get hyped up when you actually get in their presence live up to the hype. And what Queen Sheba said after coming to Solomon, she said his, his glory surpassed, surpassed all of the, the reputation that had come to the south that, I'd, that I had heard about. He, he was incredibly wise. In fact, we're gonna see that he had gold all throughout his, 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 uh, his kingdom and, and he saw silver as kind of a second class instrument. Wouldn't that be awesome if we saw our silver wear that's really silver as kind of a secondary to our gold wear? Anyone have gold wear here? Now, Solomon had gold wear, and he saw silverware as a secondary uh, instrument because he had all this wealth, all this splendor, all this influence, all these pleasures in life that you and I are prone to pursue. And here's what he says at the end of his life. He says, it's vanity of vanities. And you spend the first 11 and a half chapters just exposing these vanities to the point where many people who do not make their way all the way through Ecclesiastes come to Ecclesiastes and say that it's such a depressing book. Work's vain, wisdom's vain, pleasure's vain, wealth's vain. All these things are vain. You're like, what's the meaning of life? And Solomon, in two verses, after leading us to, to see that these shadows over promise and under deliver, he would come to the end of his book. He says, the end of the matter is this. Fear God, keep his commandments. Pursue God and obey God. That's the end of the matter, he would say, after writing this book. And this, this morning, we're gonna pick up in chapter two. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them to Ecclesiastes. If you don't know what that's it, that is, just open to the middle of your Bible and flip to the right. You'll find Psalm in the middle, Proverbs to the right, and then Ecclesiastes. And we're gonna be reminded that you and I are prone to chase after things of insignificance. Things that over-promise and under-deliver. If you're with us last week, you know that that's our definition of vanity. 30 times that Solomon would use this word vanity. A vanity is something that over-promises and under-delivers. 
And as we come to chapter two of Ecclesiastes, we're gonna come to this topic of pleasure. That pleasure is a vanity. And Solomon would engage in this kind of hedonistic experience trying to say, I'm gonna give my my flesh everything that it would desire and see if, if meaning and substance and purpose is found there and his conclusion is gonna be stated in verse one and then circle back around at the end of our time in verse 11, he's gonna state it again. It's, it's vanity, it's vain. Here's, here's what I want us to catch as we leave this morning. Many things can bring enjoyment to our flesh. You've heard me say that sin can gratify for a moment. There are many things that can bring enjoyment to our flesh, but only Christ has the ability to bring joy to our spirits. Sin and pleasure and work and wealth and wisdom and experience and all these things under the sun for a moment can gratify, but they will leave you wanting and longing for more because they do not have the capacity to satisfy your soul. If we were to look at Genesis chapter one and two, we would see, and I I think it's important for us to have a a good theology of pleasure as we consider Genesis one and two. We see that our capacity for pleasure is a part of being made in God's image. That God, when he created us, created us with a capacity for pleasure. That with our eyes we could be pleased. With our ears we could find pleasure in sound. With our, with our touch we could find pleasure with the taste. Anyone ever taste like a delicious meal? Like th- there's something pleasing about that. And that's a part of God creating us with the capacity to be pleased. But if we get to Genesis chapter 3, we see that sin infected all of creation. That the, that the effects of sin are far-reaching. In fact, there's a book called uh, uh, The Brevi- Breviary of Sin by Cornelius Plantinga, and in it he, he describes this, the nature of sin, and one of, the, one of the pictures he gives us of sin is that it's parasitic, in nature, that it, that it requires a host in order to survive. And so sin in Genesis chapter three came into creation and, and would, would attach itself to these, these gifts that God has given us, like pleasure, like knowledge, like resource, like influence, like wisdom. All, all these things are gifts from God. And last week I said the gifts of God make terrible gods. And sin would creep in and, and in its parasitic nature would attach itself to a host and distort pleasure from from being a gift that would promote worship of God in our life, to distort it, to promote worship of self within our life. And so pleasure, part of God's design, part of God's work in our life that we have the capacity to to find pleasure in sight and, and taste and touch and hearing and all these things, smelling as a gift, but we turn our demands of pleasure into a God that we would pursue. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter two would warn us that pleasure is a vanity that over promises and under delivers. Meaning if it is a end rather than a means to a greater end, if we p- pursue pleasure for pleasure's sake, it will leave us longing for more. I have had good meals in the past, but guess what? I still need to eat. I've had beautiful sights that I've seen in the past, but I still long to to see more. I've felt the, the infant in my hands and the joy that comes in my heart, but I still long for new experiences. If that experience is, is the end in which we pursue, it's gonna cause us to long for more, an empty hole that we just can't fill with enough pleasures to fill 
the cup. And, and that's the stark difference between Christianity and, and kind of the narrative within our culture. Christianity would say that pleasure is a means to worship God, our culture. And the narrative within our world would say pleasure is an end in which we pursue at all costs. The, the humanistic, uh, naturalistic, Freudian narrative is that you are a, a product of your biology and, and so you just need to feed your flesh. And if you can feed your flesh with enough pleasures, then maybe you will be satisfied. But there is no combination of pleasures that can satisfy your soul. And the brilliance of Ecclesiastes is God uses Solomon as an instrument to, to, to make known that truth. He's, he's the Bill Gates or the, or the Jeff Bezos or the, the, the Warren Buffett of, of the ancient world, right? Like anything that he could experience, he had the capacity to experience. And here's what Solomon's gonna say in chapter two of Ecclesiastes. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. I, he's gonna say that phrase twice. My, my heart still guiding me with wisdom. They, they didn't abandon wisdom, meaning he, he, didn't, he didn't engage in pleasure to the point of addiction. That he, that he was still able in, in this experiment of the flesh to, to be able to, to think through. Is, is this able to offer satisfaction? He says, my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold of folly till I might see what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of her life. Like that's the purpose of Ecclesiastes. What is it good for us to be a part of and to participate in while we live our short life on this earth? And so I, I, I pursued pleasure. Verse four, I, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of the king, kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, many concubines. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines to delight the son of man. Like, like where is the meaning of life? So I became great and I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. This is a dangerous experiment. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil and this was the reward for my work. Then I, I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it and behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun, particularly as it pertains to pleasure. That there are many things in this life that can bring enjoyment to the flesh, gratification momentary to the flesh, but only Christ can bring joy to our spirits. Three kind of outline of, of these 11 verses. The first is the vanity of entertainment. The vanity of entertainment. Here he says, I pursued laughter. Entertained by comedians and, and sought to just belly laugh. Anyone ever have a belly laugh? Like maybe if I, I just laugh hard enough and long enough that that might, that pleasurable experience, which is a gift. Research would say that laughter is a healthy thing. But if, but if we pursue life, can't have moments of, of serious dialogue. If it's all about the laughter it's vanity, pleasure. He says, I, I, I pursued laughter. It's mad. I, I pursued pleasure. What use is it? Then he says, I turned to wine to see if it would cheer up my body. Like all these forms of entertainment I would turn to just, just in pursuit of seeing, is this the meaning of life? And he, here's, here's what A.W. Tozer says about entertainment. He says, I believe that entertainment and amusement are the work of the enemy to keep dying men from knowing they're dying to keep enemies of God from remembering that they're enemies. Like if we could just be entertained, maybe we'll forget that our body is failing us, that 
As one generation last week we talked about comes and another generation comes and the other one proceeding goes over and over and over and over again. Maybe if I just entertain my mind enough, I'll forget that I'm dying physically. I think, I think Tozer is probably speaking of the spiritual death that we experience as people. Maybe if I'm just, if I could just belly laugh enough, if I could drink enough wine, if I could engage in enough physical pleasure that maybe I'll forget that I'm spiritually dead. And so this cocktail of experiences works its way into my life. And Solomon's saying that there is not enough entertainment in this world to satisfy your soul. How pleasing is the movie that you saw last month? How pleasing is the movie that you saw last week? There's a reason you keep going back to the trough to get fed because it ultimately doesn't satisfy. John Piper says this. He says, the America, America is the first culture in jeopardy of amusing itself to death. America, the first country, the first culture in jeopardy of amusing itself to death, Solomon at the end of his life, having experienced all kinds of entertainment, laughter, having experienced all kinds of pleasure, having turned to the bottle, substance, to see if that might amuse his body, he says it's vanity. I, I, I wanna point out a problem that, that we have. We in our culture are not people of temperance. And so when Solomon twice says that he kept his wisdom about him while engaging in this experiment, we can look at statistics across our country and recognize that when we play with fire, we get burned. In fact, so much so that we see 2006 that there was a shift, that more people died from opiate overdose than those who would die from car accidents. Not, not because of the extreme drugs, but because of the prescribed drugs. We are not a people of temperance. We go all in when we go into pleasure, and we abandon reason. We abandon thought, and, and our city is in crisis because of the drug usage going on. We could go down the list, and we could see that tobacco is the leading cause of preventable death. We could see that gluttony... It's the second leading cause of preventable, uh, preventable deaths. So every hour in the U.S., about 83 Americans die from heart disease and stroke. And more than a quarter of these deaths could have been prevented or delayed with better control of key risk factors. We see that STDs are, are, are destroying relationships in people's lives. This is just a small list, right? Like we could go down the list and we could see these pleasures. We could see the, the abuse of alcohol. We could see the abuse of substance. We could see the abuse of, of entertainment and laughter. And, and we, yeah, that's not even like the video, video game stats, right? Like, like there are people who give their life to entertainment and, and in doing so lose their life to entertainment, and we would be good to hear the warning of Solomon that there is a shadow that we are prone to pursue in, entertain, in entertainment, to, to please ourselves to the point where we forget that there's life that God invites us to have and that life is found through faith in Jesus to where it brings our laughter meaning, brings our pleasures meaning. I went to uh, the, the, the Grand Canyon a number of years ago and as, and as I gazed over the edge, I saw this plaque that said, glory to God, right? Like there's a God who created and fashioned this beautiful piece of artwork and, and, and I, I, I hold my kids and I say, glory to God, like this is a miracle. I was young when I had my first kid, I was 21, so that's young. You're like, woo, that's where that gray came from. I, as a 21-year-old, I held my baby and I said, God, this is a miracle. <laughs> Did not know what to expect. Miraculous. And, he, and here's how we differentiate if, if pleasure is a means for worship or if it is a, a worship of God or if it is a means for worship of self. If it's a means for worship of God it, in, in the delighting of our spirit and, and engaging in the pleasures that God has, has invited us to engage in where we, we just in awe bring glory to God. God, you, you are amazing. God, you are worthy. If it, if it promotes in our heart worship of exalting, of extolling the God of all these things. 
Like if, if, if you've ever eaten like a beautiful meal and you're like, this is amazing. The fact that God would provide all this stuff that we could, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pause and give thanks. It's pleasure as a means to an end, glorifying God. On, on the flip side, pleasure to a means to an end of glorifying itself as we demand, we demand, we demand. Like I need more entertainment, I need more wine, I need more substance, I need, it's, it's, it's all about me and, and my urges and my cravings so that we no longer can say with Paul in plenty or in want that we are content for we can do all things through Christ. We're not content. There's no contentment because it's all about feeding and fueling self and there is a vanity of, of, of entertainment, pleasure of entertainment. And God has given us a desire for pleasure, which is good, but a pursuit of pleasure apart from God has been distorted. It's, it's been affected by the parasite of sin, distorted. But he moves forward, verse four, and there's, a, and there's not only a vanity of entertainment, there's a vanity of productivity. Vanity of productivity. I, I, I made great works, I built houses, I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I, I made for myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I, I, I bought slaves, I, uh, born in my house, I had possessions, herds and flocks, more than anyone who had gone before me, so much so as I, as I said in the introduction that the Queen Sheba from the south had heard and, and come to see and was amazed. He had silver and gold, but he valued the gold more than the silver. We see the vanity of productivity. He had projects that, that he would seek to put his hand to. Now, yesterday, I, I took the ax in my backyard and, and I threw it to the wood, and guess what the wood did? It split, and it felt really good. Can I just say that? It felt good. So I picked up another piece of wood and I set it there and I took the ax and I threw it down, didn't make it all the way through, and so I picked the ax up again and I threw it down, right? Like, I'm earning my beard in your presence right now. <laughs> And I chopped wood and I threw it in a pile and the kids pulled it up to the house. And I, and I felt there was something about it that, that was pleasing. In fact, uh, Solomon would say that for, uh, in, in verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I kept, I kept from my heart no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil for this was the reward of my work. That there was a reward within the work. And what, what was the reward? The reward was the work, right? Like, like there's, there's joy in, in working. In fact, if we were to look at the Genesis story once again, that God commanded Adam and Eve to work the ground before chapter three, which sin entered the world. So sin is not the cause of work in your life. No matter what you want to believe. In fact, we are, we are created to, to produce and subdue and to cultivate. But sin has distorted and twisted and perverted our work, making it difficult as we see the ground cursed and also making our life about the work. And if you were to look at the statistics, America has some unhealthy work habits. We are addicted to our work. And now here's what happened when I chopped the wood. I chopped it, brought it up to the house. Guess what we did last night? We had a fire in our house. That was, that was the fruit of my labor. But guess what I have to do again? I have to go chop more wood. Right? It's, it's a cup that I just keep stuffing. If, if, if productivity and projects and work is what gives me satisfaction, I just have to keep stuffing. There's not enough work in this world to satisfy my hands. There's not enough work in your world. There's not enough productivity in your world that would satisfy your hands. That doesn't mean that you don't find joy in your work, in your toil, in your labor. But if that's where you find your ultimate purpose, you will be left longing for more over and over again. And we see possessions. He, he talks about herds and flocks and silver and gold and, and treasure and singers. You ever think of singing as a, as a pleasure? Right? If you're in, in, the, in traffic, we hope that you're listening to calm music. Right? There's something about music that, that calms the soul. That's why I think David was, was so influential in Saul's life, playing the harp, like it calmed the troubled spirit. He has all this stuff, and he says it's vanity. The Americans work longer days, take less vacations, retire later than any other country in the world. 
God bless America. 20 to 25% of Americans are workaholics and unable to turn off their desire for work. This, this is convicting for me as I've engaged in conversations with a number of you. I don't, I don't know as your pastor if I rest well and yet God commands us to rest. Why? Because it reminds us that God is God and we are not. It forces us to depend on God and not on our hands. It forces us to find our way to our knees over and over and over again. It doesn't mean we don't steward opportunity. We, we could read the parable of talents where, where the master came to the servants and according to their abilities, he gave them talents, one, two, three, and two of the three would go and steward and see multiplication in the talents that they were given and, and the master would come back and look at the three servants if you're, if you're familiar with the parable of talents and you would look at the one who took the one talent and he buried it and did nothing with it. You say, you wicked and you lazy servant. I'm not advocating for a slothful spirit. I'm not advocating for a lazy and apathetic appetite towards the work that God has laid before you, but may there be a warning for each of us who are prone to idolize our work and the identity that's found within that. Because there's, there's not enough work that can satisfy, and there is not a net worth that will satisfy your soul. See, God has given us a desire to work, but a pursuit of productiv productivity can, can be perverted or distorted through the, the parasitic nature of sin. And then finally, the vanity, verses nine through 11, the vanity of overindulgence or the vanity of indulgence. Verse nine, he became great and surpassed all who were before him in Jerusalem. Verse 10, whatever his eyes desired, he did not keep from them. He kept his heart from no pleasure. Like, I'm just going to experience all that I can experience. Then verse 11, then when I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I expended in doing, I, I said, behold, it's, it's all vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun, three things of indulgence that we see specifically in verses nine through 11. We see the indulgence of position, right? a power. Like I'm, I'm gonna be the greatest. If, if, if I can find satisfaction in my status, then Solomon would be one who found satisfaction in status. There were no leaders before him in Israel who surpassed him in glory and strength. We had time, we'd unpack the story of Solomon, but just hear me. There, there was a position of prominence held by Solomon to where surrounding nations knew here was a man of status and power. Did not satisfy. Pleasure. Every pleasure that he wanted. Every pleasure that he wanted. Everything that his flesh wanted. No restraint. Exploring. Is, is this the meaning of life? Is it much like the naturalistic, humanistic, Freudian experiment of, of just doing whatever I desire? Can I find meaning? Are there enough pleasures in life if, if I were to, to mix them and, and add to them? Are there enough to fill the cup within my heart that's longing for some sort of meaning, some sort of significance, some sort of purpose? And Solomon would say, it's not position, it's not status, it's not power, it's not wealth, and it's certainly not pleasures. I've tried all of them, and it's vanity. It's a shadow over promises, under delivers. And lastly, profit, his work. He found pleasure in his work, but, the, but as we discussed last week, you cannot count what you do not have. There's no number that you can put on that which you do not have. And therefore, there was always more for us to chase after in the realm of profit which is fascinating, because if you do any uh, demographic studies, you know that we live in one of the most wealthy places in America. Just this week, it came out in an article that Sammamish, of cities 65,000 and more, is the most, most wealthy city, 65,000 or more than any other uh, income per household than any other zip code in America. 
My kids go to school in Sammamish. My wife teaches in Sammamish. We have profit, and yet we could look around to, to those around us, and we can see there's not enough profit in the world to satisfy the soul. That does not mean that God cannot use our profits for meaning and significance and worth, but if, if that's what we're chasing after, then we in, in our zip code should be the most satisfied. And I, and I look around and, and I, I read the newspaper and I, I see the news and I hear stories and, and I'm just struck with the reality we're longing for something different. In fact, Business Insider this week would come out with an article saying depression, deaths of despair are on the rise among millennials, many of whom suffer from loneliness, money stress, and burnout in the workplace. Why am I pointing out millennials? Because this is my generation who grew up with all kinds of stuff, all this stuff that Solomon's speaking of. We've had access to all kinds of pleasures that previous generations have not had access to. We've had access to all kinds of opportunities that previous generations had to, had to really labor hard for, but our parents or grandparents have kind of paved the way for us, and we step into all this excess of pleasure and we experience and we, we touch and we feel and we taste and, and we do all this stuff and, and not Christian resources, but Business Insider would say depression and death of despair is on the rise among millennials who have had access to entertainment. Like my parents did not grow up with TV on demand. My dad says he had to walk uphill both ways to school <laughs> in snow. I said, what about TV, Dad? Did you watch TV? He said, yeah, we had three channels and I had to get up with my, my uh, uh, pliers because the turning knob was broken and I would turn to the, to the three channels we had. He said, and you didn't even see it good because you had those things behind the, the TV. We call those antennas. And you had to like just position them just right. In fact, uh, not to pick on my dad, his first flat screen TV he took back because it looked too realistic. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, that's what it's supposed to look like. In my generation, my kid's generation, TV on demand, why are we watching commercials, Dad? Record, watch at your own convenience. Insta everything. Insta everything, Insta coffee, right? Like, Insta, like we just need it now. And all research would say that there are not enough pleasures in this world for you and I to experience that would satisfy our soul. See, Romans chapter one, verses 19 through 20, and I'm gonna end with this, would speak of how we got to this place. It speak of why we could have all this stuff and all these experiences and, and still be left wanting and longing for more. I pick up in chapter one of Romans, uh, verse, verse 18. For the wrath of God's being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Like all research, all sources point to the vanity of pleasure as a pursuit. God's made it plain to us that that's not where satisfaction is found and yet you and I are so prone to chase after the new pleasures and he would pick up in verse 20 for the invisible qualities or attributes of God namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen perceived being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse verse 21 for all they although they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and foolish in their hearts. If you've been one-on-one -on -one dialogue with me, you've, you've heard me use the word nonsensical. The conversation in our world today is nonsensical. There's a futility of thinking. 
and a foolishness in the heart of man. And we engage in conversations where like, like surely that's not the, the best option. Like, I don't even know how to rationalize in the midst of this conversation. There's, there's a darkening of thinking. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. When we first adopted Kaya and Janessa, we brought them home from the transitional housing. They'd been moved there uh, after uh, we had been matched with them. And we pick them up and we take them to the resident that we were staying at and I filled the bathtub with about four inches of water that was warm. And you would have thought my daughter saw the ocean for the very first time. She was diving under. Keep in mind, there's four inches of water. Your head doesn't get under <laughs> unless your face is plastered against the bottom. You jump on the top of the bathtub and slide down and like giggles and splashes and water everywhere experience I had never seen. And she didn't speak English at the time and I didn't speak Amharic. And I, I just looked over and I said, if you could only see the ocean. <laughs> like, if you could only see the ocean. John Piper says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like a child who wants to go on making mud piles in a slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offering of holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. I, I believe that God in his word and through the book of Ecclesiastes, wants to expose some shadows in, in our own hearts that have uh, compelled our, our, and attracted our attention. And, and all of a sudden, we find ourselves pursuing these things. And, and through God's word, he, he exposes, he shines a light. So much so that we can, we can say, God, I, I, I'm, I don't want to see that. That's uncomfortable. I don't, I don't want to see the vanity of entertainment or I don't want to see the vanity of productivity or I don't, I don't want to be exposed to, to the vanity of, of pleasure. And, and yet God in his grace would expose it through the lens of the gospel. He would, he would say, this is a shadow that over promises and under, under delivers. And he would do so so that we would be able to embrace the substance of who is Christ. If, if you remember last week, I'm praying as we work through the book of Ecclesiastes, two prayers. One, that we would be a church that chases after the substance that is found in Christ. And as we work through this book, it's the Spirit's role to convict us of sin, to convict and expose the shadows in our heart. And the second prayer is this, that we would be a people, as, as those shadows are exposed, who would, who would show to a world that God is greater than sex, that God is greater than money, that God is greater than status and power and all these things that the world would pursue, that God is greater, that we will not be satisfied by a mud puddle. We will not be satisfied by a four-inch tub of water for we know that there's a glory that is far greater of surpassing worth that we can have in Christ. As we depart from God's word this morning, I believe those two things are, are before us, that God would expose the shadow of pleasure and that we could confess for the purpose of freedom, and that we would be a people who, on the east side of Seattle, testify of a God of surpassing worth, that we would not settle for a lesser glory, but we would be a people who demonstrate pure and complete contentment found not in stuff, but found in Christ. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that we, we are not left to our own vices. That you in your grace have revealed yourself 
that you sent your son, that you became flesh dwelling among us so that we might know you, not simply as a distant creator, but that through faith in Jesus, we might come to you as our Father. And Father, as Proverbs would say, like, do like dogs who return to their own vomit, we, we are prone to return to, to our past ways. Like we're prone to chase after the things that seem important. And, and God, I, I'm convinced that it's only by your spirit revealing to us the vanity of, of that which is pleasure that, that we could resist, that we, that we could see the, the, the means of, of pleasure as, as a greater opportunity to glorify you and to find great joy in you. And Lord, as, as we uh, have come here this morning, I, I believe that each one of us, uh, Lord, you wanna, you wanna teach us and speak to us Build within us a greater joy and delight in you. So God, I, I pray that we would confess where we need to confess, that we would embrace the things that we need to embrace. And Father, that we would worship you in all things, whether we live in a season of plenty or whether we live in a season of want, that we would be a people who find joy not by the fleeting pleasures but we find joy as our soul is satisfied in you. We love you, God, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Please stand.
Amen. And it's because of that strength that we find in Christ that we are able to move forward in confidence and faith regardless of the seasons that we find ourselves in. I'm going to make myself available to pray with anyone that would like to pray following the service, uh, maybe even specifically as you consider the shadows that your life might be tempted by. Man, I, I want to see us living in the fullness and the freedom that is offered through faith in Jesus. Just a couple things I want uh, to draw your attention to on the backside of your uh, notes. Uh, we have a work day coming up October 26th down at the building from 8 to 1 uh, p.m. We're just we're trying to do our part and do our best at preparing this space to become, to transform it from, we've talked transforming it from a bar to a place of worship, right? Uh, to reclaim this space uh, for God's glory. So we're going to be doing that October 26th and uh, should be a great, great time for a work day. Uh, bring gloves, bring crowbars, bring uh, any tools you think might be valuable uh, towards getting things uh, ready. Uh, also, Trunk or Tree, October 31st, down at the new building, uh, same, same address as before. Uh, we're going to just hopefully connect with a lot of neighbors, and our life groups are going to be uh, trying to get together and, and be a part of that, and we're, we're hoping it'll just be a fun night of giving out candy and connecting with neighbors. Um, it's a unique opportunity. Uh, Halloween, regardless of your feelings towards it, Halloween's a unique opportunity where your neighbors are coming to you. And I uh, I got, listen, I, I got all kinds of feelings about Halloween, but my neighbors are coming to me, and so I'm going to steward that opportunity and leverage it to build relationships uh, with them. And then, then lastly, every fall we do a Thanksgiving feast, a community Thanksgiving feast where we get together. I know some, many, 50% of greater Seattle population are transplants, I meaning you're, you're not birthed here. And that means many of you are looking for someone to do Thanksgiving with. And so every year we just do a community Thanksgiving feast. Again, it's a unique opportunity for us to sit down and fellowship. Uh, it's really, it's a, it's a fun night. And so I wanted to get that to you so you could just put it on your calendar. It's going to be on a sun, Sunday evening, I think, it's October 24th. And so great things ahead. Really looking forward to the season that God has before us. Uh, confident that as we fix our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith, that he will continue to do a work in us. And I'm excited for that work. And so thankful for you. Uh, praying for you this week. I'd ask for your prayers. I'm taking a red-eye flight tonight to head back east for a uh, week-long conference with uh, some churches and church planners across uh, the, the greater North America. So from Boston to Miami to San Diego to, to Anchorage, Alaska, and everywhere in between. So it's just going to be a great opportunity. Thankful for you guys. Praying for you this week. God bless.